Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Um, I'm going to pass over now to our Secretary General to uh, welcome you here. Zonia? Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome, and I'm very happy to see you here this morning and to welcome you to this webinar today um, with Gal Faganel, who is speaking to us from Ljubljana, Slovenia, where many of us um, were lucky enough to be last summer. And he's going to talk to you about um, how you can invest in your career development. And we are very curious what Gal will have to say to us. Welcome and let's enjoy. Hello. Sorry, just before that, I need to do a little presentation of um, the frame of uh, this webinar. Um, I will just be a second and then Gal, I will pass over to you, I promise. <laughs> um, Right, so this uh, webinar is the last in our series of uh, webinars um, in the EPIC project. The EPIC project is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the EU, and it is um, focusing on supporting and enhancing the careers of young musicians. And that includes training. Um, we've had uh, international opportunities with the Euro Choir and World Youth Choir. Uh, we have a data collection coming out in January looking to prove the value of participation in auditioned youth choirs and music ensembles. And we've also had a national youth choir um, aspect to this project. Um, our partners there, you will see, are JMI, JSKD and Sing Ireland. The European Choral Association is the coordinator of the project. And um, we're very, very pleased to uh, have you here today. Um, there are people joining us by Zoom and people on the Facebook stream. So uh, hello to you all in both places. Um, in Zoom, you'll be able to ask questions in the Q&A function. Just type them in when you think of them and we will deal with them at the end. In the Facebook stream, you can ask your questions in the comments and those will be passed to us in the Zoom room to ask Gal. And uh, at that point, I will uh, pass over to what you're here for and over to you, Gal. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good day from Ljubljana. Uh, let me choose the right screen to share here. So um, I went through the whole music formal education uh, only to uh, have to scramble as a freelancer scramble I had great opportunities in different facets of music industry uh, as a performer and in the production of it in Los Angeles but nobody taught me and there was no course uh, about how to manage this career in music uh, other than the maybe a traditional path of schooling and then an audition in orchestra I, I was trained in that specifically uh, so, some years later, I developed a course uh, in the U.S. and uh, recently I have uh, spoken, taught about the issues and mentored uh, musicians as they developed uh, their career. And uh, uh, in, in many ways, uh, I'm still learning how to manage my own, uh, but I'm happy to be here today uh, speaking to mostly uh, singers and uh, I love uh, singers and love choirs. Uh, one of my favorite projects I was involved with was the uh, Sofia Gubaidulina's Canticle of the Sun some years ago uh, with the Slovenian Chamber Choir. This is a picture from that concert. And uh, I grew, grew up around choirs uh, and I still enjoy uh, the sound of choir and look forward to some further collaborations also on stage with choirs. Now, music careers, or any careers really, but maybe in music more than some other, can be confusing. It's not a straight, straight path, and it can be the future can be. It's certainly unknown. It can be ambiguous, and so um, I've prepared uh, to address a number of topics that today that can help musicians navigate uh, and be successful in uh, what is a very fast-changing uh, career and fast-changing landscape in the music. And the pandemic has not made it any less um, 
fast changing. So we are used to in school to have equal equal opportunity and the same 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 test for everyone. And then in, in life, it happens that uh, to be quite different and everybody has a slightly different uh, opportunity and uh, different connections and uh, different abilities and different uh, desires. And so uh, it gets messy and interesting. And uh, as I speak on this subject uh, with musicians, I always start and continue to remind ourselves, including myself, to take care of our core competency um, because we uh, probably have noticed sometimes uh, a very successful musician that we notice is maybe not even as good as we are. And then there's this bitterness can develop and um, why is that? Because that person has probably invested much more in what we are about to talk, uh, what we are talking about today and and maybe less in in their craft in their core competency and so uh, i will continue to remind us about uh, the quality uh, so that we don't suck um, now once we have something to to sell something that we are good at then i think all the things we will talk about today are sorely needed in a very dynamic market uh, place and in a job market as well. So once uh, and for for many of you have probably already done your 10,000 hours. Uh, I uh, maybe you're familiar with the concept that it takes 10,000 hours to master a, a skill uh, in a certain narrow field. Uh, I think most musicians by the time we get to the end of uh, university studies, we we're way beyond those 10,000 hours. Now that does not necessarily address the quality of those hours and the quality of practicing of focus. Um, but that's one good question to ask uh, for, for those younger among us. Uh, are we there? Is there still musically, artistically, educationally development to be had? And then there's also continued improvement uh, and and refinement and continued education that uh, if we um, spend most of our hours after our schooling promoting our career we may get better and better at our marketing skills uh, but uh, worse and worse at let's say singing now the the pandemic uh, and other economic uh, situations have um, caused a lot of turmoil in the job markets, uh, not only among musicians, but especially among performing musicians. And so a lot, a lot of musicians have, uh, after a year of not having uh, opportunities to work or perform, even entertained or sought different careers. And just for some perspective, here is a little excerpt from a New York Times article uh, where about a study uh, where 44 instrumentalists from Juilliard were followed, traced, uh, to see what happened in their careers long term. And uh, some of them were not even found at all, which is strange in the era of internet. Uh, many of them are not in uh, professional music performance. Some work in a related field and some work in unrelated field. And for uh, many who have had such a narrow path, such a focused path with the promise of the, being the best in their profession studying at Juilliard, uh, we, we can also ask what kind of, kind of um, consequences that has on just mental health and, and satisfaction of, of, uh, of what uh, they do. So uh, statistically, it's about half of the people that stud, uh, that uh, are working actively in their narrow uh, discipline that they studied. And this is not just from music. This is, this is statistics from the US actually, uh, from colleges. Uh, but I also find that uh, it is not, uh, not very different other places. Um, once we consider how many musicians, uh, let's say pianists, that ends up working as a, 
as a recording engineer in a radio uh, organization or something like that. So this is just for some perspective uh, because uh, having a fulfilling life in music does not mean having a full-time position in, in, a, in a performance organization as a performer on stage. Now one way that we can promote, we'll go, I know I have limited time and I'm keeping track of time, so we'll, we'll jump into uh, some essential aspects of uh, promoting our career or, or to advancing our, in, in our, the business of music. Writing is paramount. Uh, in Europe we have many different languages uh, and we have a lot of tools now so we are able to translate things uh, but in whatever market you are most present in it is important to write well in, in the, for that audience that you're addressing. Um, English of course helps. Some of the documents that um, is good to have well prepared as we are trying to promote ourselves is the artist bio or let's call it, uh, actors call it a one page where it usually has a picture and the rest of the page is filled with their uh, accomplishments. Uh, I recommend that uh, artists, musicians have three different lengths ready. Uh, for example, 75 words, 250 words, and 500 words. 500 words is about a page, printed page. Uh, 75 words is something that can be squeezed just about into any th any little blurb. So if there is a very li if you're a part of many performers, uh, but they are allowing some space, uh, you you're better off sending them three versions where you select what is in the 75 words rather than sending them 500 words and them selecting that you have a dog and that you speak five languages. Uh, maybe that's very important, but you probably want to be in the control of that message. As you write those bios, of course, you'll start with just, uh, I like to say, throwing up on paper just to have the amounts uh, amount and then you edit 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 and in the smallest one in the shortest one 75 words that's very short that's three four sentences maybe five uh, it should really be the es the most essential the most important how you want to be seen now the truth is most people will not read past 75 words even in your long bio so what's important is that the uh, most essential stuff that you want to communicate is at the very top. How you improve your documents is by writing, rewriting, editing, asking others to read uh, and offer you feedback, ask for feedback. Uh, my wife is tired of reading my materials because I change I'd say it's for a, for a job opportunity and I change two, three sentences out of my regular kind of job application letter and of course I have her read it again and uh, because uh, she's an English teacher. Also a quick tip avoid long sentences and some languages are more prone to long sentences than others it's definitely uh, a quite a quite a disease in Slovenia and I know German is also prone to uh, long sentences and long words. Uh, this is all well and 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 the linguists and the the language experts will say this is just how it is in the language but for promotional purposes be concise uh, I even heard someone advise that there should not be sentences that are longer than nine words now in English that's a little bit easier English tends to have shorter sentence structures as you write these documents you will get to know yourself if you don't know yet uh, if you, uh, so, so it can be a self-discovering process. Uh, you also notice what achievements of yours you value, what, a, what achievements you, uh, you put on there just so that there is more there. Maybe initially early on you'll have some things that eventually as, as more things you, you get more, more experiences that you can put on there uh, and more 
uh, affiliations with the different organizations, then some, some things uh, are become less important, which is where rewriting comes in. I have even heard of uh, people sending two CVs, one that's uh, something that's condensed on one or three pages, and then one that's a complete CV, so that people receiving the documents can have a concise version, but if they want to check everything that that person has done, they can have the 30 pages if it's someone with considerable experience. Another document that can be productive, that can be interesting, also is as a self-reflection, is a repertoire list. Things you have done, things you have played, you sung, sung all the repertoire, organized in some manner that uh, you can navigate well. And uh, especially for singers, I believe that's uh, that's a standard document um, that uh, sometimes is asked for and is is uh, very useful. Uh, for some of us uh, that uh, do more of teaching, uh, teaching philosophy statement is a good document. Uh, sometimes it's asked for. Sometimes it's nice if it's just included. Uh, it's just a little bit broader than your letter of interest or your, your, your bio where you can talk about how you see your role as a teacher, what your pedagogical approaches might, might be. Uh, and when you start writing, I remember when I first started writing uh, a teaching philosophy statement when it was required for a position I was applying for in 2004, I think. Um, I was lost. Uh, so first it was more of what 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 was my teacher's approach and then over time it becomes your own and and you uh develop more of your own pedagogical approach and and what what you care about and who you are as a teacher and mentor let's talk about publicity when we try to uh call attention to an event that we're a part of or are organizing what are some things that are newsworthy Anything controversial, something challenging the norms. You know, sometimes they say any publicity is good publicity. Now that uh, we can be, should be careful about that. But anything unusual. So uh, once I uh, hiked a uh, 14,000 square, uh, 14,000 foot high mountain in Colorado. This is the highest mountain in the Rocky Mountain. A national park and I didn't think much of it I did it with the cello and played on top of it and then um, I sent a photo to the local uh, local club uh, hiking club and then it all developed into a big article that the local newspaper did and it went the, the article went national this cellist had a concert and a violinist had a concert on top of the highest mountain there and sometimes you never know what what catches people's attention this was not intended as a publicity stunt, but in retrospect, it was quite a publicity stunt. It had tens of thousands of views and, and so on. So it was something unusual, unexpected. Significant achievements, competitions, awards, uh, any collaborations. So that, that can be useful if you collaborate with someone that maybe has more uh, of a track record, is more known. Uh, that, is, that is good to use. Another worthy cause, not necessarily arts, uh, connecting, collaborating with another. Uh, so benefit concerts uh, fall under that category. Or any professional appointments. Uh, even some magazines have uh, a section dedicated uh, to different uh, job, job uh, changes, changes in jobs, people who are appointed to these different positions. What are some things that are interesting? We want to try to tell a story in whatever is happening, uh, establish a personal connection. Uh, I think that's why at the end of BIOS some people talk about uh, you know, liking to hike and having a dog and other hobbies and liking to cook and things. It's an, it's an attempt to connect with uh, the listener audience member at a different level from, from the, the artistic. Um, because sometimes, especially when our audience is non-musicians, uh, there is a little barrier there, and so what can we do to connect with with those people uh, to remove that barrier? Innovation is interesting. Um, an example could be some some things that uh, have been done in the last uh, few decades with 
media, electronics, lighting, different things. Um, we continue to innovate. In anniversaries, it's always a, a good reason to, maybe in programming, to remember certain uh, composers or, or things in history. As we do, as we write, as we submit applications, as we uh, make contacts with people, it's important to maintain high standards in, in writing, in, in our communication. So proofread everything uh, three times if necessary. Uh, check if the email actually sent or it, it, was, it was it stuck in outbox. That ha happens to me sometimes. Uh, and, and also when when talking uh, to have high standards to not mince words to be have something to say um, something that will present your high standard is just the format in which you present your writing and now in email sometimes formatting is is secondary uh, but still, with email, I recommend that paragraphs are short and emails, try to make them short. Not only short sentences, but just say say the minimum. Um, we are all overwhelmed and when we get a concise email with a couple of items in there, it's much easier to deal with than something we have to read and go in depth. Consider font size uh, when uh, preparing these documents. So they're readable, at least uh, Times New Roman number 12 or something similar. Uh, margins, um, you know, play with margins uh, to fit stuff on the page. That's a useful, useful thing. And if you are able to fit what you're writing on one page or on one screen, so sometimes if it's a website, consider that. Uh, consider that most people will not scroll past what they see on the first page. Just like most people will not read most, more than 75 words. And it's, uh, that's the reason why you want to put the important info first. I'm just checking the time here. I think we're moving along okay. Now, it's really important what the message is. So whether you're making a, a, a notes, program notes for, for a recital, or, or it's a promotional material, it's an advertisement of sort. And here I just want to share a, an unfortunate advertisement by a, a U.S. bank um, that I won't name because it doesn't need to be advertised. It's a big bank. It was just trying to get more customers here. And it said, it said that uh, this girl was a ballerina yesterday and it, she's an engineer today. So therefore... Uh, engineer must be more valuable than a ballerina and an actor yesterday and a botanist today so an actor again the botanist must be better than the 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 being an, an art actor and an artist and after this this was my the last straw I, I changed the bank um, but this is just to illustrate how important it is to consider all segments of the audience that might read our materials might might see us perform, hear us perform, and I think musicians have the hardest time connecting with, connecting with non-musicians. I think singers are a little bit less guilty of that. I think instrumentalists are more likely to hide behind our instrument and not connect with the real world of non-musicians. Uh, but even in among professional uh, professional musicians. Uh, it is important to consider the non-musician's perspective. That's also the only way that uh, we can grow our audience. Uh, musicians are not interested in, in expanding and going to even more concerts. Uh, but I think that the non-musicians have that capacity and we can try to attract them. Um, this is just an example of an unfortunate website design. And so another thing to pay attention to as you design promotional materials, whether on the web or uh, printed. Make sure it's easily readable as far as the font, font size. Make sure it's clean and that, it, that uh, the page that you're on, whether 
on a screen or printed includes empty or negative space the designers would say so don't try to fill everything up um, on this page for example we have negative space here not not intentionally but that would be that's an example there's somewhere on the page where it's not crowded with information and as you look at this purple poster or a website it is intense and I don't want to keep reading because the colors are wild and uh, it's just uh, offensive so color choices come into that you know you can choose a color scheme but keep it simple uh, let's talk a little bit about the ethics involved. You know, ethics is not something that you can mandate or morality or legislate, but uh, there are a lot of opportunities for for some conflict of interest or or you know gray areas of the truth as we present ourselves. So uh, everyone has to decide for themselves how how to present themselves. But just a few examples of where where I think we must consider how as we try to embellish uh, the way we present ourselves and you know we want to make our our uh, in the competitive world our materials as as good and make us ourselves look as good as possible in our materials but where does that line where is that line between the embellishment of an achievement or good presentation and and the untruth uh, for example, there can be a, a, a restaurant that serves, it's how you present a dish or you make a substitution in a dish that makes it something other than what they are serving, uh, whether they use food coloring for something or, or, or just make a substitution, you know, it's a, it's a fish, they advertise it as a trout, but it's actually tilapia. Uh, that that is done um, that would be the untruth but uh, the embellishment would be have that fish have that trout but be very well presented on a plate and served and the environment that that the enter the restaurant creates is is very pleasant so how do we do that um, there are some I'll give a few examples of where where, where I've seen people get caught or you know it's just it could get tricky so uh, we can present when if we were in a finalist in a competition we as I've seen it presented as being a laureate of a competition well that's that's a stretch um, or that uh, she has collaborated with such and such world-renowned conductor or singer was it a collaboration was it an equal type of role or was it a saying in a master class once you know for half an hour uh, so one way to avoid it and everybody can decide where where that limit is uh, I've seen gross untruths in 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 present presented materials uh, but I also seen unnecessary modesty uh, so I think this is good to consider and uh, talk to your peers talk to some mentors uh, about how to best present certain things but one maybe guideline here is if you have a dilemma write it out very specifically and that might enlighten whether it's actually an achievement you will actually see well if I'm very specific here I may not even want to include it uh, because if it's a master class with someone maybe it's not all that important and so when you when you're specific and you're writing just expand and then you can you can condense again uh, it's not public until you make it public a um, little bit about speaking so sometimes you have an opportunity to speak with someone for just a few seconds or a minute after a concert you go to a concert and you want to connect with someone have a have something prepared uh, I think it's uh, it could could be almost um, you know it's foolish to just go around confident that you always will know naturally how to what to say so have have a one-minute speech prepared 
and uh, know what you want to achieve. Also have something to hand uh, that person, whether that's a business card or a CD or maybe a card with your web information. Things have changed since since CDs some 40 years ago. Uh, but having something physical to present is is a plus. And then also being present and actually paying attention to that person uh, in those that very short time uh, is very important. In the course I teach, we actually practice this, and it's good to practice. Now, if you're not in a course like that, take advantage to expose yourself in that way and uh, go to a concert and go at the end of a concert. Uh, go, go meet the artists and, and practice speaking to them. Uh, find something that you appreciated about their performance, something specific, uh, just to, um, to practice engaging in that way and you also never know what good comes out of it sometimes. I find that uh, as we expand our network, we, as we make an effort to expand our network, uh, a great way to do it is to go to um, other people's concerts uh, because we as artists appreciate that we want people at our concerts and so if someone took the time in this era of clicking through YouTube to hear performances to come to, to get to your concert and sit there for an hour and a half that's a big commitment and I think we appreciate that any artist does so sometimes we talk about an elevator pitch or an escalator pitch <laughs> uh, so a very short time that you might have an opportunity to speak with someone in an elevator on the way up or down. Just checking the time again. Okay, so as we try to connect, connecting is better than not connecting, whether it's with individuals or, or with organizations. And as we develop, develop our uh, career as artists, we are building our support network. Anything from our, uh, you know, we may think that's a completely different domain, but even our, our, our personal doctor is in a way a support network. Uh, because when there's an issue with our voice or our hands or, or something, we, we might go to the doctor and that's also a support network. Our insurance agent may be a are part of a support network. Uh, so I already addressed this now. There's a slide about expanding, uh, attending concerts. If you can't go to a concert, we are a lot of times busy in the evenings or when concerts are with another concert, go to a dress rehearsal, uh, show up um, in, in that wherever you can uh, to connect. Uh, initiate a meeting. Uh, one of the best ways to connect uh, in my experience is to be asking for advice uh, and uh, to be focusing on, on others. So if you're focusing on yourself is you're asking on ad for advice. If you're focusing on others is, is that you're, you're really there to, to hear them, to watch them. Uh, everyone has to eat so uh, asking someone to share a meal together uh, that's also a great way to connect with someone. It's, it's much harder to refuse that when you know they need to eat. Is business card still appropriate or still the thing to have? Uh, here just I'll repeat, uh, have something to give and if it's a CD, if it's an album or if it's a card, promotional card for what is available online that's good as well and it should look professional and uh, high quality. <laughs> voicemail, it's interesting. In Slovenia, nobody has voicemail on the phone and nobody leaves a message, uh, or very rarely. But if you have that ability, I encourage you to uh, activate it. And that also presents you, because when anybody calls and they don't reach you, there you are speaking to them, whether they decide to leave a message or not. It's just another way to connect. Now, as we try to grow our audience, uh, we need a way to compile these contacts. And so there are services available uh, like MailChimp or similar constant contact. 
there's also you can use your contact app uh, but transferability can get messy you can also use a slightly lower tech version like an Excel spreadsheet that you manage the challenging thing is how to keep up so uh, you may want to organize a, a regular input day whether weekly monthly something like that where you input you have a box where you drop all your any contact you get um, so that you have a regular input into that and that way your list grows something that MailChimp does well is they can geographically separate so if you have a concert in this city you can just send invitations to this city and so on online community is changing fast I don't know that I have a lot of advice uh, I'm very torn about Facebook and other things I do have a professional Facebook page but I have not updated it in months um, I think it's a it's a huge energy suck and uh, but also it's it's uh, invaluable uh, as a connect connecting mechanism um, so it seems like in Slovenia if it's not on Facebook people really don't know about it uh, and I think I'm guessing at many other places it's the same uh, so it, uh, having an online presence is important um, then how, how, how much you sp time you spend and how much money you spend because it, you can also be promoting yourself by paid advertisements there uh, that you decide uh, but just a few pieces of advice uh, whatever you present make sure it's quality be selective about your content uh, you might have a lot of recordings uh, of your uh, performances select only the best uh, the monetization is just something that I think some of us may get to the point where it's worth doing uh, but it's actually detrimental if you you're gonna have 20 to 100 views per month uh, and then those are important viewers there maybe maybe will be future supporters and and future connections it's really negative if they get hit with an advertisement right when they open your video so I recommend that you do not monetize and you have your your advertisements off uh, definitely customize it uh, YouTube that would be creating a channel I have to speed through this here Facebook try to separate professional from personal uh, Facebook is not best for cold contact just someone bothering you on Facebook that you don't know who they are and remember that not everyone uses Facebook in the US about 71 percent of the people are on Facebook so if you've missed just a little less than a third of the people and of those who who use Facebook about a third of them never or very rarely log in so you are not you're not known by everyone if you are on Facebook some other ideas uh, in, in expanding your network uh, you can use Google Docs also for for gathering uh, data uh, you can asking for phone number is useful these days uh, you can use text messages or SMS to, to invite people to update people just always make sure you give them a way to opt out if they if if you have a large network you know with emails it's standardized you have an un unsubscribed unsubscribe button on the bottom as you're looking to promote yourself names are important whether it's your domain name your Twitter handle Facebook name and artist page and in some cases a business name or a trade name and uh, we have people from different countries here so I won't give specific advice but each country is a little bit different as far as registering a trade name or or um, a business name sometimes you can use your own name sometimes you need a different name but be careful in selecting that it's an important uh, decision uh, I will right now because of time not get into the details of uh, website creation but uh, in any case seek advice for multiple people know who you're ask who you are asking advice from uh, you know don't take any advice just as as if it's really important and everyone has a different perspective uh, but it is okay to ask advice of people who you disagree with uh, because you will get another perspective 
Now maybe we finish with how do we manage all this uh, and the specifically with you know do you try to get management or do you uh, try to self-manage um, and just how you manage how you manage from day to day uh, with money and health. Uh, competitions are no longer the only way to get your name out there. Uh, competitions were was was one of the few ways you either had to know someone wealthy would promote you or you needed a competition 50 years ago. But things have changed now and um, there are prominent artists who never won competitions and there are also uh, people who won big competitions who were less successful in the long run. Uh, when we are self-managing, uh, one, one challenging thing is how we set our price how how much will we go play for and with that consider your costs consider um, sorry I'm skipping a little bit here uh, consider what your peers are charging you can always find that out from people you know uh, asking what the budget is is appropriate uh, so that you know the ballpark sometimes they'll disclose that sometimes not sometimes they'll make you an offer um, depending on how badly you want the gig um, maybe you can negotiate when you negotiate you know you don't need to say that uh, you just need a higher fee you can say well may I get travel expenses what about this what about that so there are other associated fees um, there are issues of, of performance rights uh, if you are self-organizing a concert, if you're self-managing, depending on the venue. In any case, whether you're touring or you're presenting a concert or CD, launching a CD, make sure you have a timeline. It's an essential uh, component of planning the project. Uh, most, most of us, when we are unsuccessful, including myself, is because there was not a realistic timeline. And Speaking for myself, I, I'm notoriously bad at estimating how much, how long a project will take. Uh, so uh, then, you know, either sleep suffers or, 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 or family time. And I think I'm almost out of time, so I'll go to something that is, uh, I'll skip a few things, a couple of uh, recommendations so freelance work many of us are freelance musicians so itinerant so we play a week with this organization sing a week with this other organizations teach in between reputation is carved and what I mean by that is when you make a, a deep cut that you didn't want to it takes it takes a lot of effort to make it make it good again uh, and a reputation is gained over the long term uh, so in that sense uh, it is. Uh, it it takes a lot of effort, and it's always based on the past. Uh, so it takes a while to change. I'm gonna go faster here. Managing money is funny. A lot of times in the arts, we spend the money, we do the project, and then we get the money from a grant. It's not always as clean as we got funding and then so so sometimes we sacrifice our own money in between it can be interesting uh, here I, r I have a little bit more about grants and things like that but we unfortunately don't have time for that but I want to get to a couple of book recommendations this one actually changed the way I treat sleep I used to say I'll sleep when I die uh, that didn't turn out so good because then uh, it's not healthy. Uh, a very good s uh, sleep uh, book about sleep. Uh, it's about, it writes, uh, it It talks about all the findings uh, from, from some 600 sleep studies from the last 30 years. Uh, and it's, it was very impacting for me. Highly recommended. A couple of other books. Uh, Beyond Talent, Creating a Successful Career in Music. It's only already in the third edition by Angela Miles Beeching. I also use that book as the uh, as the course material for for the course. Uh, it's great. 
and also a, a new, newer book, just kind of advice from professional musicians, the musician's lifeline, and then also um, on the topic of of uh, meaning of work and uh, and work satisfaction, how will you measure your life? Uh, flow, uh, flow is also very interesting uh, from the perspective of performers and practicing. Uh, the Psychology of Optimal Experience by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and uh, also Howard Gardner and same author Mihai Csikszentmihalyi wrote a book Good Work When Excellence and Ethics Meet. I'm going to finish here uh, so that we have time to address a few questions. Thank you so much for this girl and um I think we can maybe start with a, a practical question because we saw how much of the presentation we had to skip through for time reasons. Um, is it all right if we share your presentation with the people who registered for this uh, webinar afterwards? Uh, is it uh, could I share it with? Yeah. Can oh, we, the what yeah. what I skipped through. Yes, I'm I'm happy to share. Um, I wonder if I should convert it. We can figure out whether to convert it we'll into PDF or something. Yeah, 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 <laughs> of course. Stuff, but we'll be able to send uh, something. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. We have a few questions then um, that have been coming through uh, during your talk. So uh, let's start with the first one. How do you manage the fine line between good freelance self-promoting and bad self-centered spam? Wow, let me think about this. So on one side is good freelance self-promoting. I what I don't I don't know. Do you do you know, Sophie, what a bad self-centered spam might be? An example of that? Yeah, so I think this would be um sending out a lot of maybe untargeted material, just sending out a lot, a lot of information all the time. Yes, I think I think I understand that. It just took me a little while to put myself in that position of being a recipient of that and what the damage that might do. Um, so I think if you have something to say, something to contribute, then it may go into self-promoting. But I do find if it's completely selfish, it can backfire. Uh, so, so the advice, also the advice in the book by Angela Miles Beeching is people can smell when you're in it just for yourself. So this is not just where you're sending messages out. Uh, even if you come attend the concert, you meet the person uh, in the back in the green room or somewhere, meet the performer, and you just talk about yourself. It, it, it's already, people can smell that. And so care about other people. And I think, yeah, you know, it's a cliche, but good things will happen to you. Uh, because if you care about other people, they'll care about you. Um, that's, that's sort of what, where, where I would, how I would answer that question. So um, I think informing people of things you're doing is okay. I think it's more when, when that real selfish motivation comes, comes through that, that it can backfire, it can, it can come out as just selfish, self-promoting, you know? Yeah, I, I think I actually read somewhere that the biggest thing that people remember about you is how you made them feel. So, yeah, <laughs> a selfish approach, they'll remember that too. Um, okay, let's move on to the next question, uh, which is coming to you from Ljubljana, in fact. Uh, I have a question about self-promotion. How do you get over the fear of self-exposure? Promoting your concert is, for me, a different sort of exposure than actually performing. Yes, um, I've read a few articles in in uh, New York Times recently on the topic of uh, being an having an imposter syndrome. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where you feel very insecure, like you're not good enough to be there. And I think we all deal with that. And if we're honest with ourselves, that that's that's a that's a state, that's a feeling we can have, and we can examine it, look more objectively about it. That when we are young, younger, with less experience, uh, we might have those thoughts. You know, all these people around me, 
uh, know what they're doing. I, this is I, I don't really have a place here. So, you know, I'll go a little further. Promoting a concert can feel like, um, yeah, I, I, I can I can relate to this this idea, especially from earlier in my life when I had to write a write a bio and and write about myself, and it just seemed, why why am I doing this? Someone else should be doing this. Uh, so. I'll, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the questions. How do I get over it? Um, I think by knowing who you are, uh, some of that fear will go away. Uh, sometimes it's just with practice. Find find a find a way to do it in a in a more a safer environment. Invite some people to your concert where that you do know, uh, and then you you get a little bit more comfortable with it um yeah I'm, I'm searching for what what else to you know i i think the, i it's probably a part of a development as as an artist uh that this this fear of self-exposure i mean as an artist you'll be fully exposed so so the 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 better the sooner you can manage that fear you know i won't say get over it because that doesn't help I think we we accept that we're 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 insecure. All musicians, most musicians are insecure. I, that's just it's 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 like most musicians are are a little bit uh, nervous going on stage. It's a it's a similar thing, and and the sooner we m learn to manage that uh, that those feelings that come when we are publicly performing, the the more we can. Uh, gain from it and have that energy actually channel into something good. So maybe similarly to that, we recognize the fear and and accept it, and then I think it will be easier to um, to move forward. Yep, yeah. you can't just get rid of it. So yeah, use it to your advantage, and you're not alone. <laughs> Um, speaking on uh, a slightly... May I just... I'm sorry. I just thought of something else. So <laughs> for, for all these fears and, and, and insecurities and, and, and reservations we have, find peers that have the same. I think sometimes we, we end up alone in these dilemmas and, and we cook alone. We keep simmering alone. Uh, to, your peers, our peers have the same issues. Uh, whether that's from your class, from your choir, from your, uh, or you know, someone you know, that's uh, they they just haven't shared it, but they probably had the same thing. So uh, you're going to learn a lot from your peers, whether to how you revise your your uh, bio or or how you deal with being afraid of promoting yourself. I think that's really good advice. Yeah you're really not alone but if people aren't speaking about it you well, feel you can... alone yeah exactly so um on a similar note but maybe uh, perhaps it's asking for a bit more concrete examples maybe um you spoke about unnecessary modesty did you ever notice any imposter syndrome like traits in musicians proposing projects if so what would you suggest to deal with it it's a bit similar but i wonder if there's something else you could say yeah, it, it, uh, I'm glad we're talking about this topic because it's not talked about. Uh, it's very hard to make it a topic. Even even with someone you know, you don't think to talk about it. Um, so how to how to deal with how to deal with unnecessary modesty? I think what we have a uh, trouble with early on in our career is how to objectively know how good we are where we are where you know uh we all wish we all do our best and and so with the feedback we get not from like the critic in a paper necessarily but feedback we get from people who were involved with us in in the arts projects we are get seek honest feedback and also you can also sit someone down and say um I wanted to talk to you critically about my career. Um, will you tell me where where I am? What are my limitations? Am I fooling myself being able to do this? I think 
uh, in this era of not only you know kind of one needing to be politically correct, but also uh, if we refer to Dale Carnegie's the idea of how to make friends and influence people, where you're always more or less nice to people and not and sometimes you uh, not not straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's it it we can get to a place where nobody will tell us that we're not good. And and sometimes even seen situations where a teacher is hesit hesitating to uh, to tell someone, you know, this this professional opportunity, I don't think you're right for it. Mm -hmm. And and I've been in a situation, and it's tough as a teacher, but I think it's a responsibility that we have to help as as a mentor uh, to 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 help the person. We get feedback as we grow up in music from different places, from parents, early teachers, and we always get, in, get some encouragement and get some feedback. Uh, but was, as we grow older, uh, more independent, that, we, that feedback goes away. Uh, so try to, uh, try to find out. You might get a lot of really good feedback. Then you will see, you know, uh, I, I had a person, now I remember, I had a person help me write uh, a bio once. It was someone who was um, involved with National Endowment for the Arts as a, as, a, as a panelist there and had a lot of experience with it. And she so skillfully brought out the things that were valuable in my existing bio. And so then they went to the top. So having other people look at your career can be really helpful. Yeah, and that's interesting. You say it's so uh, challenging to get the this kind of critical feedback and so it's interesting to talk about setting expectations at the beginning of that conversation saying i, I would really like you to um yeah be critical don't like worry that <laughs> i only want to hear good things i i think it's really good advice yeah i hope this answers the questions or at least uh, further is a little bit the the thought process if you have some time i have one more question <laughs> that's come from somewhere else yes um you mentioned asking for advice as a, a good way to connect with people. Um, could you speak a bit more about this? And do you have advice on how to ask for advice without seeming just to be taking up someone's time? Well, again, I think you will be taking someone's time. Um, make sure you're a nice person. Uh, be interested in them. You know, I recently had um, just short meeting over a cake with the conductor. And um, I like this person very much, uh, but don't know him very well. Uh, and I just asked him about his what he's doing. I was interested in him and what 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 his next thing is and and we talked about music some about the previous night's concert and that i went to again i went to the concert i was interested in in his art and then i asked him he has a new, unique perspective i thought on on career in music and i asked him uh, for some perspective and advice and uh that at that point yes it was that that is for me uh, but I think the relationship has been established by I'm I'm interested in what what he's doing. It was the respect uh, that was that was shown. Uh, so I think if you're nice to people, uh, if you if you care about other people, uh, it's okay to ask for advice. The other thing that with advice that's great is people like to be asked for advice. People feel valued. Uh, like their opinion matters. Someone, someone wants their advice. So whether consciously or subconsciously, it's a positive thing uh, rather than a negative when you ask uh, for advice. Do you think it works in um, different formats? So, I mean, the example you gave there, you were speaking face to face with someone over, over cake, but can someone also do that by email or do you think it's not so good? It's tougher, isn't it? Email is so dry and impersonal. No matter how much you do it, we get too much of it. So, you know, the 86th email that comes in that day and it's asking you for advice, it's tougher. Mm -hmm. I think it's tougher. So, so you know, finding in-person time, whether it's, it's uh, a after a dress rehearsal or something or asking people for to share a meal together. It took me um, 
this was not i didn't have a big goal to meet with this person it was not a big deal but it took me a few months and a few few times of this person being in town until this happened so you know yeah it if you care to get advice then you create the opportunity to uh to get it and sometimes uh, oversteps some 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 bound that maybe maybe are there either for you internally where you don't don't have the courage or or maybe also uh kind of societal norms maybe sometimes you'll uh you know people in Slovenia people are very uh they they will go for coffee and things like that but as far as the one thing I learned recently because I moved back to Slovenia very recently um uh, uh that is uh uncommon to have people in in your home yeah you know much more so than my experience was in the US yeah don't, don't yeah. be afraid though it it's not it won't it won't i i don't believe it it will count against you if you make an effort in that so go seek advice you'll make people feel good by seeking advice and also don't feel like you have to take it you can also find a I, like I, I already said today uh, you can ask advice of people you, you know you disagree with and you won't necessarily take it but you will understand better their perspective fantastic i think that's a great note to end on and uh, a motivation for everybody watching either live or uh, watching this later uh to go out there get advice and i hope that some of the anxieties and fears that we have heard coming up in the questions there are feeling a little bit more taken care of and that you have some ways to uh look after yourself um in that way as well so gal thank you so much for this and uh zonia would you like to say a couple of words there it's just a, a big thank you from my part as well and i must say that listening to your presentation we said it was advice for musicians but actually i think it was advice for many other professions as well i could relate to that also as a manager a lot of things you said i think are useful for my own work as well so thank you very much for this great presentation my pleasure i pass um, back to sophie i don't know if we still have a and on that note say. i am going to uh pass to estera in fact um who is going to close the session with uh some ways that we can stay in touch but before I just say maybe thank you once again because there's, there's never enough but also what an engaging way to present everything with all the on point graphics and comics that it was fantastic really and um Yeah, Sophie is going to just be the moderator <laughs> for my uh tiny intervention, but mostly it's just like if you enjoyed today, let's stay in touch. So just search for European Choral Association on most social media accounts and you're going to find us there. And on the next slide, you're going to find out how to um subscribe to our newsletter. So we send once a month um just updates from um our association and our members as well with opportunities across the cultural sector and events and much more. And yeah, just to remind you singing is good for you <laughs> we're having a um a campaign going on we're probably going to keep continuing it so we're just talking about the four uh, benefits for areas uh, in which singing helps us so it's either educational psychological physical or social skills that we're developing and yeah just being healthier individuals through singing so if you want to contribute or get involved you can translate the content you can reach out adapt it to your needs or just make it part of your publications or your events that you're carrying on and yeah thank you very much for attending the webinar uh let's stay in touch we will send you an email in the following days with the presentation and yeah all the social channels that you can um search for um to stay in touch afterwards and yeah if you have any questions we're just an email away as said don't be afraid to reach out we're there for you So thank you everyone for joining and I hope to see you in a future webinar. Bye bye.